Good afternoon. It's a great pleasure to welcome you here today, um, and a particularly warm welcome to Paula, Paula Gooder, who's spoken here twice before. She's a very distinguished biblical scholar um, and is canon theologian at two cathedrals, both at Guildford and at Birmingham. I'm not quite sure how she manages to fit it in. Um, she's also the author of numerous books on the Bible, um, and recently she's been exploring um, the spiritual nourishment that we might gain through the seasons of the year. Um, she's spoken, as I said, twice before, um, and one of her books was The Meaning is in the Waiting, which was a reflection on the season of Advent. Today, she's going to talk about a rather less glamorous season, which is that of ordinary time, which we're in the midst of right now. We've still got a few weeks to wait until we hit Advent. Um, so exploring God in the ordinary and what this might reveal to us about the nature of God and our faith. Paula will now speak to us for a good half hour, I hope, and then there'll be time for questions at the end. Thank you very much. Well, it's uh, great to be back here again. Ordinariness is really rather out of fashion, though one, you could dispute whether it's ever been in fashion, but it's most definitely out of fashion these days. Um, even the word itself we now use as a slightly derogatory term. You know, that meal was ordinary. I've just got my ordinary clothes on. That football team were on pretty ordinary form today. All of those kind of phrases rather imply um, not very good, not very spectacular, nothing to write home about, something that's not really very kind of worth thinking about. And um, anybody who's involved in education will know the slight problem of the phrase satisfactory. If you are, have an Ofsted inspection and your school is termed satisfactory, you will know that that is in fact unsatisfactory to be called satisfactory. And so you have this kind of sense within our culture today that ordinariness is something that is best avoided. And um, I've been, the more I've thought and thought about ordinariness, the more it's become clear to me how out of fashion ordinariness is. Go into a supermarket and try and buy one of your favourite products, only to discover that it is all new recipe, bigger, better, brighter, better packaging. I stopped for a moment when I was in the supermarket a while ago with my hand over my favourite hand wash, which declared itself to be all new, biggest, best hand wash ever. And since my hand wash washed my hands, made them smell nice, smell nice and was antibacterial, I couldn't quite work out what this new hand wash did that my old hand wash didn't do. So we're in this kind of trend not only against ordinariness, but towards excellence, towards the best ever. Um, I was also entertained recently to read in um, the newspapers that Starbucks America have bought out a new size of coffee, which is called the Tronte, or Tronte, um, which is apparently 916 millilitres, um, which, according to scientific survey, is 16 millilitres larger than the average stomach. <laughs> which um, rather makes the mind boggle, doesn't it? So you've got this kind of sense that not only is an ordinary not very good, that we're constantly striving for bigger and better and brighter. And you begin to wonder how far this can go on. How long can you go on getting bigger and brighter and more spectacular? But there are other issues as well, which I think kind of become clear once you start reflecting on this urge away from ordinariness into specialness, which is that things can't be special all the time. Almost by definition, you cannot have a birthday every day of the year. You can't have Christmas, despite wishes of Christmas songs. You can't have Christmas Day every day of the year. Um, and there have to be times of ordinariness. There have to be things that are simply ordinary. And the problem is, is that if, if ordinariness is only ever something that is disappointing, something that makes you feel that it's a shame because it's only ordinary, then actually we're missing out on something really quite important. 
And so in the book, what I've done is tried to reflect a little bit on why ordinariness actually might be something that we need to remain with for a little bit, to reflect on, and to begin to get a sense of what a spirituality of ordinariness might look like and feel like. Let's think for a moment about Christian festivals. I've mentioned um, Christmas Day already, but of course the year of the Christian year is split up with Christian festivals. You lurch from one festival's period to another festival period, from Advent into Christmas, from Lent into Easter. And actually, those big times of festival, of celebration, are really very important for our Christian life. But you need the other times as well. Because the other times are what gives the light and the shading to the special times. If you imagine a picture that is only light, actually you would not be able to see the key parts of the picture because you haven't got any of the shadings there. I would argue that there's something about ordinariness which is about trying to recognise that the shadings in our life The dull bits, the ordinary bits, are actually as important for us in our lives as the special light, shiny bits. So part of our aim, therefore, as Christians, is to become people who can live the whole of our lives, all of it, um, Monday morning in February as much as the glorious Christmas day, Um, the grim bits when it's raining as much as when the sun is out, and actually finding our spirituality and encountering God in those bits, as well as in the shiny bits, seems to me to be really quite important. And when you stop and begin to reflect on the ordinary bits, the everyday stuff, you begin to realise that actually there's something really quite important going on that if we're not very careful, we miss. One of the things that we often do as human beings is we rush from one brilliant time to the next brilliant time. And as we rush from the one to the other, actually we often miss something that is staring us in the face, the great things that are really very important for us. And um, I rather feel this is um, summed up quite nicely by a poem by someone called Saunders Lewis, who's a Welsh poet. And um, he says this in the middle of his poem called A Daisy in April. Yesterday I saw a daisy, like a shining mirror of the dawn. The day before I walked over it without a thought. Yesterday I saw. And what he's talking about there is the fact that it's just a daisy. There it is, just a daisy. It's ordinary, it's nothing special, we've all seen a daisy. And most of the time we just trot on our lives and go, there's a daisy, not very exciting, on we go. But there is something sometimes about being able to recognise that it's a daisy and isn't it beautiful and look at the white petals in fact when I was um, my children were smaller one of my children was in the push chair and I was trogging along away um, home from school and uh, we passed this real muddy patch and I was thinking oh, muddy patch and on I was going it was rainy it was cold I was miserable and she, uh, my little girl said mummy mummy look look And I thought, what am I looking at? And she said, look, 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 it's a daisy. And she got out of the pushchair and she got down on her knees in the mud. And I was thinking, on her knees in the mud. And she's saying, look, look, the daisy's got little tiny pink bits on the end of the white petals. And the yellow bit in the middle is furry, mummy. Look, 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 isn't it exciting? And I remember that over and over. Because actually, to me, it was a daisy, an ordinary, unexciting, uneventful daisy. To her, it was a wonderful miracle of yellow furriness with pinkness on the edges of the petals. And in a way, that sums up so much of what we do in our everyday lives. Um, So often, God is springing forth before our eyes, but actually we don't notice it. And we don't notice it because we're not looking for it. One of the kind of key things for me about our ordinary lives is that we are so convinced that God is not going to be found here on a grim, rainy Monday morning in February that actually God could be jumping up and down shouting at us and we wouldn't notice because we know God isn't there. Part of the spirituality of ordinariness is becoming people who can recognise the extraordinary in the ordinary, the wonderfulness that appears before our eyes. And there are certain things that we need to do, characteristics we need to adopt in order to be able to do this. And it can be summed up in the phrase, for me, turning aside. One of the problems that we often have, and as Saunders Lewis implies in his poem, that we just do not take the time to turn aside. 
We don't have the ability, the imagination, or the expectation that anything special could happen in the ordinary just to stop for a moment to turn aside and notice that daisy, notice the sun breaking through, notice that act of God in the midst of our everyday lives. But actually turning aside does take quite a discipline. You actually have to have time to do it. And this is where I'm conscious that I am speaking to myself probably more than anybody else. The trouble with our lives is we simply don't have the time to turn aside and take the time to reflect and expect the presence of God. But the other thing we often don't have is the curiosity. One of the things I think which is a lost art of Christian spirituality is curiosity. And it's kind of partially because we're trained out of it, aren't we, as children? And I'm very conscious of the way in which I try and train, train my children out of it. We say, stop fiddling. Don't ask questions all the time. Those kind of things. Why do you have to ask why all the time, we say to them? Well, because actually, it's a spiritual discipline. And how, ever since it's occurred to me that it is a spiritual discipline, it's made me realise that I need to stop telling them to stop asking why. What would have happened, for example, if Moses, while looking after his sheep, had seen a burning bush and said, actually, I'm a bit busy today, um, haven't got, quite got the time, um, I'll go on my way looking after the sheep, I'll come back tomorrow and see what the bush is about. Or if he hadn't been actively curious about it. In fact, the Hebrew in the story of Moses is really interesting because Moses has this little inner conversation in the Hebrew and he says, why not turn aside and see what this bush is? So in a sense, what you get from the story is Moses having this kind of moment of growing curiosity, where he says, well, I wonder what this bush is all about. If he'd either been too busy or hadn't had his curiousness um, alert, then actually Moses might have missed the burningness of the bush. If you read on in Exodus, you might wonder whether he sometimes wish, wished that he had missed the burning bush. <laughs> um, because um, the next chapter... The next chapter of Exodus, um, Moses explains to God why it is he can't possibly do what God wants him to do. It's a great um, piece in which Moses asks five questions, um, largely along the lines, well, who am I and who are you and why are you sending me? My favourite end one is, please, Lord, and I quote from the Bible at this point, please, Lord, send somebody else. <laughs> it seems to me that actually... Turning aside, being curious, taking the time to look at the burning bush actually is a risk. And we need to be clear that it is a risk. Um, God might actually speak to us. And one of the things that we often do, as I think, is that we so easily are so convinced God is not going to that we don't hear. And in any case, it would be rather inconvenient if he did. And so we conveniently don't notice there is something about the spirituality of ordinariness which challenges us to take time, to be people of curiosity, and also to take the risk that God actually might speak to you and then be prepared to do something about it when he does. So let's turn our attention for a moment and reflect on ordinary time. In a way, you can't help thinking that isn't it just typical of the church that society as a whole doesn't like ordinariness. It's something we shy away from. It's not a cultural um, feature of our society today. So what does the church do? They have a season of ordinariness. Isn't that just typical of the church? Well, actually, yes, it is typical of the church, and it's typical in a really, really important way. Um, one of the interesting things to notice is that the term ordinariness is quite new. The term ordinary time is quite new. It arises from the time of the Vatican Council, the Second Vatican Council, when they established this period, ordinary time. And um, we need to be quite clear, however, that the phrase ordinary time doesn't mean what many of us think it means. Um, and you have no idea how many conversations I've had with clergy at the beginning of ordinary time where they say something along the lines of, oh, how are we going to get through ordinary time this year? <laughs> the implication being, it is the most boring, the most dull, the most unengaging season that there could possibly be, and all we have to do is survive our way through the end of it, and then we'll be okay. 
just in case you didn't know there was an ordinary time, um, just to be clear about ordinary time, ordinary time is that season which falls potentially twice in the year. There's one big, big season of it, which runs from the end of Pentecost through to the beginning of Advent. So you have a really long period of it in the middle of the summer. But depending on when Easter falls, you might also have a little snippet of it before Lent. I think it's highly unlikely we're going to get much ordinary time next year because um, Lent, Easter is very, very early. But there is um, also a period of ordinary time that goes from the end of Candlemas to the beginning of Lent. It all depends how early Lent is, whether you get much of ordinary time at all. Um, but what does the phrase mean? I said already it doesn't mean what we often think that it means, um, that it's just ordinary and unexciting. Actually, the phrase ordinary time comes from Latin, tempus ordinarium. And the phrase tempus ordinarium actually means measured time. The ordinarium bit is the measuring of it. And you can see why it's called ordinary time when you stop and think about it. If you have a look in a lectionary, then one of the things that you will observe is that ordinary time is marked by the number of Sundays it is after. And I forget for the moment, it's Trinity, isn't it? No, we won't measure it after now. So you will have the first Sunday after Trinity, the second Sunday after Trinity, the third Sunday after Trinity. And the important thing about ordinary time is that you're counting the weeks past. And the reason why this is really important is that it's about measuring time as it goes past. One of our problems, I think, about ordinariness is we're so uncomfortable about it, is that we don't actually recognise there's something important about counting it past, measuring it past, and saying, here is the first week. Now, what's happened in this first week? Let me reflect on the first week and see what has happened. Now it's the second week. Has anything changed in the second week after the first week? In a sense, the essence of ordinary time is about savouring. It's about the ability to savour time as it passes and to notice what is important and what is interesting about what has passed, even if it be as ordinary as a daisy in a muddy puddle. Um, it is the noticing and the savouring and the reflecting of what God has done and how God is speaking to us as we observe the time passing. And that is what alerts us to something actually quite important about our own inner spiritual lives is what ordinary time is designed to do is to remind us that all of us need to find our inner spiritual rhythm, whatever that inner spiritual rhythm looks like. Ordinary time is about a big church season that focuses us down on what our internal spiritual rhythm might, might look like. One of the problems when you start talking about that kind of thing is the assumption that I'm then going to tell you what it ought to be that I will that have come with all the answers and say, well, actually, if you want to establish a good spiritual rhythm, what you need to do is say morning prayer, say evening prayer, have a daily Bible study, da 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 And spirituality is littered with good advice on what you ought to do. And at this time, I, I need to um, do a little bit of confession which is that for years and years and years, I grew up in the church, my father um, was ordained, is ordained, and um, I grew up in the church, a Christian the whole of my life. And until I was well into my 30s, I was absolutely convinced I couldn't pray. I was totally and utterly convinced that everyone else in the whole of the church were brilliant at praying, and I had no idea how to do it. Um, which, when you recognize that I'm a biblical scholar, is a bit of a confession to make to you. Um, and it was only after a long, long conversation with my spiritual director that I realised that I'd got it wrong, and I got it hugely wrong. And actually, I was really good at praying, but I was only good at praying like I pray, not like everybody else prayed. And for me, it was the biggest forgiving moment, was the moment that actually I realised that I could say, I'm no good at praying like that person does, but it doesn't mean that I was bad at praying. Let me explain. One of my big problems, uh, well, many of my, I've got lots of big problems, but one of my big problems is I'm an extrovert. And those of us who are extroverts, um, it is utter torture to tell us to go into a room on our own, close the door, and be quiet. And I have tried and tried and tried. I have been on silent retreats. I have tried praying for hours on end. And every time, it was simply a moment of inner torture. I couldn't do it. Hence my conclusion that I just couldn't pray. Until my spiritual director said, well, okay, you can't do that. When do you feel close to God? 
we began to explore the moments when I began to feel close to God. And it became clear to me that actually I had loads of moments when I was close to God. I felt close to God when I was baking with my children. I felt close to God when I was digging in the garden. I felt close to God when I was making jewellery on my own. I felt close to God when I was writing books. I could go on. There were endless, when she's got me started, she couldn't strap me up about when I felt close to God. And then I began to realise that my problem was I had assumed that all of that stuff was too ordinary. You know, you can't pray while you're washing up, can you? So therefore it isn't praying. And what she made me realise that actually I was praying. Um, I just was casting it in the wrong kind of light. Now, those of you who are introverts will be throwing up your hands in just as much horror as I throw up my hands by being told to sit in a room quietly and pray. The point is that you shouldn't pray like everybody else prays. You should pray like you pray. But the point is you need to work out what that is and what that looks like. And just assuming that because everyone does it like that is the only way to do it is to miss the point entirely. And so part of a spirituality of ordinariness is actually to discover how in an ordinary way. Think about you know, your boring normal week. When do you feel close to God in that boring normal week? When are the moments when God touches your life? And those are the moments that you need to stop and reflect on and say to yourself, how is it that I can deepen those moments? How is it that I I can make the most of those moments and begin to recognise that God is speaking to me in those kind of moments? Part of the importance of ordinary time is that it's the recognition of rhythms, as I said um, earlier on. And a rhythm is about getting you, it's a little bit like steering yourself into the current of a stream. Um, What you need to try and do is find out where you pray and then become expert at at doing that. The problem, of course, that happens is that rhythm can be boring. Rhythm is not something that is exciting, to return to my earlier theme. And therefore, there is an element to which you have to work out where it is that God speaks to you most profoundly and then get over the hump of boredom. Then get over the fact that actually it's really difficult to do that all the time. And once you've done that, then you'll begin to realise that actually the stream carries you. And the stream can carry you, but only if you pay attention to it, if you practice it, and you do it intentionally. Because it would be lovely to say, wouldn't it, um, every time I do the washing up, I pray. Ha! Huh. <laughs> every time I do the washing up might be a good start. But <laughs> the point is that it's not every time you do the washing up, you pray. It is only every time you do the washing up, you pray, if you pray while you're washing up, if you get the point that I'm meaning. So you, it is about the intentionality of it. So there is something I think really quite important about the recognition that we need to find out who we are and our ordinary spirituality is plenty good enough for God. We need to have the confidence to develop that ordinary spirituality and offer it to God with everything that we have. And the other thing that we need to be very clear about is that actually God is a God who loves ordinariness. And this is where you get into a slight tension, but it's important to recognise that the tension is there and very significant. Um, Over and over again in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, people yearn, people have an experience of God, so they'll have a moment where they experience God, and then they build something. They build an altar, they build a building. You'll remember, if you know the story, um, the story of the Transfiguration, where Peter sees Jesus transfigured, And his first instinct is, let's build something. Because what he wants to do is to make it permanent. He wants to build something lovely to say, this is the place where I encountered God. Now, the good thing about that is God is an overwhelming, a powerful and awesome God. And it is right that we should give absolutely everything that we have to worship God. But the problem is, we assume that because we like building things and putting gold on it and embroidering it and making it absolutely spectacular, that actually God likes that. If you read your way through the Old Testament, one of the things that you discover, and over and over and over again, God says, I don't like your fancy buildings and your posh festivals. Actually, I like contrite hearts. I like people who do justice. I like people who encounter and worship God. 
So we want to make things wonderful for God, and that's a right instinct. But we forget that actually God really does like ordinariness. And if we, therefore, by extension, um, if we think where we might most often find God, by extension, the obvious solution is we might most often find God in the ordinary things of life. So God, therefore, can be encountered in ordinariness. And the way in which we can begin to recognise that is the recognition that we can expect to find God in ordinariness. Um, It's so often we think that actually the place where we will find God most often is in a place like this, wonderful cathedral. Now, I, like many other people, have encountered God in cathedrals like this. But actually, you can't hang around here all the time. Well, some of us can, maybe. But um, (laughs) most of us don't and can't expect to hang around here all the time. And of course, if you do hang around here all the time, that becomes your ordinary. So you do therefore need to be able to recognise that it is the encounter of God in ordinariness which is very, very important. And the other thing that it does, which for me is really very important indeed, is it reminds us that we can be ordinary too. That actually if God loves ordinariness, he loves ordinary you. And he doesn't want you to polish yourself up. One of the things I'm often struck by when I hear people talking about themselves is they'll say, well, I am just dot, 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 whatever the just dot, dot, dot is. And the point is, God says, I love just. It's great because I made you to be you. And therefore, you don't have to polish yourself up to be the best person possible. You don't have to say, well, actually, I couldn't do this because I'm not quite good enough. The point is, God loves ordinary. And therefore, the ordinary you is good enough for God. But of course, you've got to get the balance right. And the balance is, for me, one of kind of the key things that we have to recognise. The trouble of saying that God loves ordinary and that you can pray in the way that you do, and that it's not very important about going to big buildings, is it's kind of a council of laziness. You know, just good enough is good enough. And the point is, just good enough is good enough, but it's not the appropriate way to respond to God. So we have that tension, and it's important to keep the balance right. God loves ordinary. He loves you as you are. He loves you to pray in exactly the way that you can, And you must do that to the best of your capacity because that's the only appropriate way to respond to God. And so you've got to keep those two things in tension, which seem to me to be very important indeed. Now, I just want to end by introducing you to one of my ordinary people from the book. Um, Because for me, one of the really fun things about writing this book was it was the excuse to rootle around in the kind of the, the kind of dusty cupboards of the Old Testament and to pull out some of the really interesting people who we don't normally encounter. So just in five minutes, let me introduce you to one of, one of my absolute favourite ordinary people from the Old Testament. And um, most people have never heard of her. And most people have never heard of her because she really is literally in the cupboard at the end of 2 Samuel. Um, At the end of 2 Samuel, you've got a little bit of um, what we kind of call miscellany. Um, They're the stories that are too good to leave out, but haven't quite fitted in. And so they don't fit chronologically. And they're all just kind of like, they're the junk cupboard at the back, you know, like your attic. Too good to throw away, but don't actually fit in the house. They're those stories. And um, one of those stories is the story of someone called Rizpah. And Rizpah was a concubine of Saul. And uh, when Saul and Jonathan were killed, um, Rizpah obviously had the excruciating experiences that those people had in those kind of contexts. She lost absolutely everything. She wasn't even the widow of Saul. She was a concubine of Saul. So just imagine how little she had in those particular contexts. And the story is set up as being one of those awful, gruesome Old Testament stories. If you have come across it, you've probably skipped over it because it looks grim and awful. Um, and in order to understand it, you need to go back a little bit into the Old Testament. When Joshua first settled in the land, this group of people came to Joshua and said, we've heard how brilliant and fabulous the Israelite nation are. Will you make a covenant with us? Now, one of the things you may remember from the Joshua story is that, uncomfortable though it makes us feel, Joshua Joshua was instructed to wipe everybody out from the land. Now, the Gibeonites were evidently rather clever. 
they lived in the land, but they dressed up like they'd travelled a really, really long way. You know, and they put dust all over themselves, and they made the horses look really tired, and looked like they'd travelled for miles and miles. And they came to Joshua and said, will you make a covenant with us? Um, we've heard how brilliant you are. Joshua falls for the trick and makes a covenant with them. And he shouldn't have, and kind of part of the conflict of that bit of the story is what happens as a result. But because he's made a covenant with them, they can't then punish them. So, skip on a bit um, to the future. Saul remembered this story and decides to punish the Gibeonites for what they'd done all the way back during the time of Joshua. And so he killed loads and loads of them. Saul died. This is where we get to the start of our story. So the Gibeonites came to David and said to David, um, we have this huge thing against the descendants of Saul, will you let us wreak our revenge on them? So you can see the cycle of violence kind of spiralling out of control, um, backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards. So Saul says, yeah, um, so David says, yes, that's fine, um, take your revenge. Hen enter Rizpah. Rizpah was the mother, obviously, of some of Saul's sons. And who better to wreak revenge on than Saul's sons? So uh, they took a number of Saul's sons, some of whom were Rizpah's children, and they did something to them on the mountain. Um, you can tell I'm a real biblical scholar now because the word is really unclear to work out precisely what they did. It was very unpleasant, is what we can work out. Um, and all we can tell from the text is that it involved scattering, but precisely how they killed them remains unclear. But it was gruesome, it was gory, and they scattered them on the top of a mountain. Now, Rizpah was by now an ordinary person. There was nothing she could do about it. She had no power whatsoever. And so the interesting thing is to observe what it was that she did. What Rizpah did, according to the text, was she sat from the time of the barley harvest to the time that the rains came. Now, for us, we go, oh, well, she sat on the mountain for a little while, until you realise that the barley harvest is in April and the rains come in October. So basically, she sat on the mountain for at least six months. And what she did, the text tells us, is to beat off the wild animals from the dead bodies. Now, and again, because the trouble is you read this passage so quickly, when you go, well, she sat on the mountain for a bit and kept the, the bones safe, you have to bear in mind that Israel is a place in which you have, you know, lion-like animals. You have vultures. Um, you remember the story about David and how brave he was because he um, protected his flocks from the wild animals. Rizpah was doing that to dead bodies. So just imagine for six months what that entailed. And all she did was she sat there and she grieved for her sons and she protected their bones from the wild animals. And then, and then David heard about what he had done. And what's really telling about the story, and for me, kind of really very striking indeed, is that when he heard what Rizpah had done, he went and he collected all the bones that were on the mountain and gave them a proper burial. And if you know anything about Jewish customs, you will realise that burial is very, very important. But even more important, he went and collected the bones of Saul and Jonathan, who had been left to be disrespected after their deaths, and he buried them too. So what you have is this quite remarkable story of somebody who was ordinary, about as ordinary as she came because she had lost everything. There was nothing she could do. She had no power whatsoever. But what she did was what she could. She did the only thing she could do. But having done the only thing she could do, she made a great king repent of his actions. And the reason why I draw that connection is that Saul and Jonathan were left unburied because David was still so angry with them. What Rizpah did was allow David to see that what he was doing was actually unloving and uncaring and therefore buried their bodies. Um, so he, she transformed the action of a king and she stopped in its track. A, a cycle of revenge, because if you remember, the Gibeonites took, well, Saul took revenge on the Gibeonites, the Gibeonites took revenge on Saul, and you could just see how it was going to spiral out of control. Rizpah, in her ordinariness, changed that. 
And actually, as you read your way through the Old Testament, you discover that Rizpah is not the only ordinary character. There are lots of ordinary characters who, by their very actions, show us something about how we can live out our ordinary lives. The lesson we can learn from Rizpah is that you should just do what you can. And even if you think what you can isn't big enough, with the grace of God, sometimes it is absolutely transformative. And so as a result, I would say ordinariness is a really important theme for us to reflect on. And I would like to encourage you to go away and spend some time reflecting on your own spirituality of ordinariness and see where it gets you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paula. Um, I was very struck by this um, notion of turning aside. Um, and I wondered how it might relate to wonder, that wonder at the ordinary, and what you said about your daughter being captured by the sight of a daisy. And interestingly, the, um, the sermon we just heard at the Eucharist was about um, entering the kingdom of heaven and becoming like a child yes. to enter the kingdom of heaven and having that sense of simplicity and trust and wonder, um, which also suggests that the kingdom of heaven is very close to us if we can nurture that uh, quality of wonder. Um, but I also wondered if wonder <laughs> um, is related to wisdom mm -hmm. at all. Um, my Old Testament knowledge isn't sufficient to really say much about that, but, but do you see a relationship between everyday wonder, if I can say that, and wisdom? Absolutely. Um, not least because the little phrase in the Old Testament that's used over and over again is the fear of the Lord is beginning of wisdom. Mm -hmm. And that word fear could be translated as wonder without stretching it too far. Mm -hmm. um, and actually it's quite a nice thought to translate that out. The wonder of the Lord mm -hmm. is the beginning of wisdom. So there is something about, and what, what the Old Testament says over and over again, is that wisdom isn't about knowing things. Wisdom is about knowing what you need to know. Wisdom is about putting yourself in the place that can begin to be somebody who can learn things, who can wonder about things, who can recognise the extraordinariness of the world in which we live. So yes, I would kind of draw quite a strong connection between wonder and wisdom. I mean, in a sense, because we have become very cerebral and perhaps focused on knowledge rather than wonder very often. But I think in Orthodox Christianity, they have that refrain, wisdom, let us attend. Yes. Which that's is very right. much about attending, I suppose, to the, the ordinary around us. Yes, that's right. Yeah. And, and sometimes it can be in just the littlest of actions. You know, in the tasting your cornflakes a bit more in the morning, in slowing down even, even only for five minutes, just taking that time to allow yourself to, to look and to hear and to wonder, and in that to recognise something of God. Thank you. Um, do we have questions from our audience? So the relationship between ordinary and worship, yes. and the fact that in a sense, worship will always be extraordinary um, yeah. Well, do you want to comment on the, how the extraordinary becomes an ordinary bit and then I'll pick up the other bit? Yes. Um, I mean, as somebody who's leading worship a lot of the time in St. Paul's, um, it does become every day because it's simply what I do on a daily basis. But so often I'm just sort of caught off guard by the the incredibleness of what we're doing. But I think that that incredibleness is transferred everywhere. So it has a particular form in St. Paul's Cathedral. But, um, I mean, one of the most arresting things for me within St. Paul's is when I'm celebrating at the altar and I look to the West End and there we just have a, a plain glass window. It's huge, but it is just plain glass. There's no, it's not stained glass. It's just plain, and the sun can stream through, but it's almost the, the plainness of the glass that is even more arresting. And it may also be that in a building like St Paul's where we've got mosaics and lots of 
fantastic, huge pulpits that are intimidating for anybody who stands in them. Nevertheless, we need, we need that plain glass window to recognise, I mean, this relates to what you've been saying, to recognise the beauty of all those other things. Um, so from my perspective, that's, that's um, what I feel about worship at St Paul's. And I want to pick up, because um, I, I just kind of want to reiterate what I was saying really, is that, um, again, what we so often do when we talk about things is we assume it has to be one or the other. You either can love extraordinary things or you can love ordinary things, and you can't have them both. For me, the point I'm trying to make is that you need the ordinary in order to help you un appreciate the extraordinary, and you need the extraordinary in order to help you appreciate the ordinary. And what's happened is that because we've lost a love of the ordinary, actually the extraordinary is losing its power as well. And so I absolutely relate to the fact that, you know, coming here is an extraordinary experience, and that's absolutely right. But unless we can learn lessons from that and take that outwards into our ordinary lives, then there's not a lot of point to it. And likewise, just as, you know, the recognition of the ordinary, the little daisy in the mud, the plain glass window, helps us to appreciate something about the nature of the extraordinary. And it's about recognising... Um, I learned a new phrase recently, which I'm using all the time, a tensive relationship. And it's a great phrase because it means that you hold things in tension and actually the, this needs that in order to be able to be held, held properly like this. And so I want to say absolutely I agree with you and that's why we need the ordinary. I wonder if that's... Because um, one of the things I was thinking when you were speaking was about truthfulness mm -hmm. and how we recognise truthfulness. Because we live in a culture where everything is sensationalised and reporting things in an unsensational way is not captivating yes. to us, we can, we perhaps miss the truth that's there mm. because we want to make it so extraordinary. Yes. Um, and sort of truthfulness in worship is, I think, related to authenticity. That's right. Um, and... I think it was it, Lucy Winkett had a phrase actually, which is um, the opposite of boring isn't entertaining. Yes. yes. Um, authenticity is something that's bigger than both those things, if you see what I mean. So authenticity in worship is, from my point of view, equally important. And, and that's it, and exactly yeah. the same for us. Yes, no, no but, it, but it is exactly the same for us, isn't it? Is that the trouble is we, we kind of tell, and, and when people tell the story of their Christian journey, often they tell the big exciting moments. You know, you kind of have this moment and then that moment and then. And the problem is that because that's how we tell the stories, we always assume that they're, they're the only bits that matter. And the truth is it's the bits in the middle that are the bits that really do matter. And for me, one of my passions is we need to become better at telling the boring stories, you know, the ordinary stories, the stuff about what happens on a Monday morning, because only then can we begin to have the confidence that actually that's a really important part of our journey, just as much as the big exciting bits are. Well, I mean, I, I think, I mean, I, the point you're making is a really, really important one, is that actually a lot of people's ordinary time is grim. Um, and, and sometimes it's not, even so, it's not even so dramatic as grim. It's just grinding. Um, because, of course, even in saying, you know, what about pain and things, actually that, that's going to the dramatic end of ordinary. What if it's just a long grind that never seems to get better? And I think the answer is that in it, what, what, dramatic or not, spectacular or not, God is always to be found. And one of the, for me, the things that I've learnt kind of through the years is that if I am not finding God, it's not because God isn't there. And so there is something about learning that attention to the things of God. And this is why the extraordinary becomes very important, because it helps you attune yourselves to the encounter of, with God 
in the big and spectacular moments, so that in the dull, the grind, the difficult times, you can sometimes just get a glimmer, and it's often just a glimmer, it's often just there and gone. Um, but, it's, but nevertheless, if you're good at recognising it, then you can say, there it was. And it's about that, rec it's recognition about reflection and expectation that you will find it. So I think I would want to say, yes, I think actually a lot of our ordinarinesses are grindingly dull, but nevertheless you will find God there if you have the capacity to attend. Do you think there might be ways in which we can help one another find God in the ordinary? By telling stories. Right, yes. By telling our stories again and again. Um, because again, I mean, I grew up in the kind of church where people came and told their stories of faith, but they were always just so brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they'd always been really, really bad and had a really great conversion. And I was a vicar's daughter and I sat there going, I wish, you know, I wish I had the chance to do things like that. Um, and the problem is, is that you kind of, you kind of get that kind of element of celebrity Christian, don't yes, you? Yes. Well, you know, th this, this is the proper kind of Christian, you know. Um, if you haven't got a spectacular story to tell, then you know, I wouldn't bother telling it because that's not the real thing. Mm. And I think one of my great frustrations is we're still really bad at simply just telling the normal stories of faith. You know, the I was on the school run and mm. story, mm. Um, rather than there was a big flash of light and a bush was burning and, 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 and. You know, actually just the little tiny, the glimmer, the glimmer moment that I was just mentioning earlier, that just kind of, that little sense, um, or, you know, one, or that just the one word that somebody says to you in conversation that transforms something that you're doing. You know, we just need to be better at telling those stories. Yes. Because it's in telling those stories that you can then say, oh, now, that thing that happened to me, maybe I can see that in a slightly different way. And so it, it, it is about that kind of mutual sharing that helps you on the journey towards yes, that. Yeah. Uh, we are, I mean, I, I think I, I, would, I would say a lot more than slightly tainted. I think we are absolutely under kind of the pull of that sense that everything has to be brilliant. And even if it isn't brilliant, you'll talk it up and make it more brilliant than it was. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Whereas most of us actually, when we hear those things, when, well, let me speak for myself rather than most of us, I, when I hear those things, just end up getting depressed. Because, you know, I can't tell the story like that. My life does, hasn't got that content. And that's what I meant when I said, you know, it took me years to work out that I could actually pray. Is that, that recognition that actually my good enough was good enough. And, and some, how do we begin to kind of pull it back a little bit more into the recognition that most of us will, will do no more than be just good enough. But that's fine. And God loves us just as we are. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm, if people know about Myers-Briggs personality type, I'm an ENFP personality type. And um, some clever person has written prayers that match your personality type. Um, and my prayer goes, dear God, I'm so glad to be here in front of prayer with you. Oh, is that a bird over there? <laughs> so I am the ultimate distracting personality type. Um, and, um, and what I've learned over the years is, um, if I'm doing something while I'm praying, then actually I'm much less likely to be distracted because there is something that I can do that helps me to focus. And the other most important thing that I've learned is to forgive yourself as soon as you're distracted. To say, that's fine. Because the trouble is, I would get into that cycle of, I'd start, I'd be distracted, and then say, well, I just can't pray, can I? Look, that's an example of how I can't pray. Um, and then I would beat myself up for the next however many minutes it was, and then the prayer time was over. Um, whereas if you can say, I get distracted, I distract myself, I am distracted. Look, there was a moment when I was distracted, now let's get back again. But that's fine. Actually, it is about that kind of forgiving cycle that helps you to get back into it. So my two top tips would be do something else while you're praying and forgive yourself when you get distracted. And do it again tomorrow and the next day. Because you know, the other trouble is we go, well, I can't do it then, can I, and give up. 
And the point is, carry on. I think the problem is we have, as our sort of um, uh, blueprints, sayings. You know, yeah. Blueprint yeah, exactly. That's right. Yes. And, and part of what I wanted to write the book for was, let's just have a few ordinary ones. You know, the ones who get cross and get grumpy. And you know, I've got people like Jonah in, who runs away, and Paul, who takes no notice. Those kind of people who are just like us. I think we've got time for just one more question, if there is one. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Paula. That was wonderful. Um, and thank you all for coming and for your questions. Um, we'll be meeting again in a month's time when uh, Dave Tomlinson will be here speaking about his most recent book, How to Be a Bad Christian, which sounds <laughs> just up my street. Um, there are further details about what's happening for the rest of the year, but also I urge you to pick up one of these leaflets, The Case for God. This is our autumn series, and there'll be various speakers talking about the case for God, why we might believe what we do, um, and they look to be very interesting. There'll also be opportunities to buy um, copies of Everyday God, uh, just over there, or just there, just here, just here, uh, which Paula will be able to sign. So, if we could just thank Paula again for being with us, thank you. Thank you.